Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to speak to all of you uh, today. And I'm going to be talking about uh, software defined radio. But first, um, I want to, if you indulge me just a little bit, I want to kind of qualify it, uh, the audience here. Um, how many people have been, ha been hams for 30 years? Raise your, raise your hand. 40 years. 50 years. Wow. How many have been hams for less than a year? How many are not hams but want to be? How many are not hams but will never ever be hams? <laughs> you can leave. <laughs> well, you know, when, um, when, I, uh, when I started ham radio, it had been a few years since I sort of got the uh, urge to learn more about electronics and electricity. And I, and I bet you every one of you in this, in this audience can probably relate back to an incident in your youth where that, that spark occurred. Um, for me, um, I was about six years old and had just moved into a, a new house and I had a big room to myself. First time I've had, I you know, slept alone in a room. And it was, uh, what I wanted to do was be able to turn the light off from my bed because I like to sit and read uh, at night. So I said, okay, I'm going to make a light switch. So I went and rummaged through my dad's junk box, and I grabbed a switch. And I said, hmm, how am I going to hook this up to the bed? Ah, well, there's an extension cord. So I cut the extension cord, wired it right to the switch, plugged it in the socket, nailed the switch to the post of the bed, laid down, had the light on, flipped the switch, light went out. <laughs> oh, it's magic. <laughs> I flipped it again, and the light didn't come on. <laughs> and I flipped it again, and, well, there's something wrong. You know, then next thing I heard, who blew the fuse? You know? <laughs> so I figured I'd better learn a little more about this. But that was the impetus for me. <laughs> but today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the next. What button do I push? That one. Uh, software defined radio, and it looks like this. Uh, and I have uh, a couple of examples up here. Um, how many uh, of you ever owned an SB 104? Two new. Wow, one. So when I was a kid, kind of relating back to the kid thing, um, I thought, you know, that when I, when Heathkit came out with this rig, this was the first digital rig, one that was clearly outside of my budget. But it was the one that I just drooled over for years and years and years and years. Well, <clears throat> I recently had uh, a little bit of time on my hands, and so I kind of undertook uh, um, a reconditioning project. And I went out and, on eBay and other places and bought myself a full set of SV104 line, and <clears throat> I basically reconditioned it. I you know, went through and restored it. I had the full set done, but you know, just like all of these sort of vintage projects that you have, you end up with lots of spare parts. So um, when I started to uh, uh, get involved in a high-performance software-defined radio, um, I, uh, I had a ready set of sort of parts to go along with this. We'll get into that a little bit later. But first, I want to kind of uh, talk about a, a couple of other things. One is that who knows about Moore's Law? Everybody? That's basically you know back from the early PC days that they said that Performance double as price halves. Radio follows Moore's law too. Um, in the first 50 years, you had everything from electric mechanical sort of arrangements, spark gap, uh, back into the second half of the last century. We got transistorized, and what we're here to talk about today is what's next. Next. <laughs> so. In the early days of radio, there was really no such thing as software. Although it, it, this is an arguable point. A lot of people could say that there has been software ever since the Greeks sort of invented uh, um, robots. Uh, but um, there was really no integration between radio and software. The only, the, the only software was really the operator or the operators uh, running it. I guess I've got to get closer to this thing. <coughs> then, um, starting in the 60s and uh, moving into the 70s, started to see a lot of peripheral devices that, um, that incorporated software. Uh, who remembers HAL uh, for, uh, for, for RIDI as, a, as one of the early examples? 
very cool piece of gear. I mean, when you when you first saw letters crawling across the screen coming from the radio, that was pretty exciting stuff. Um, you know, and, and one of those Western Union teletype, that was my first ready, you know, encoder. <laughs> and now, what we've ended up with is a fairly well integrated set of gear. Just about any new radio that you buy probably has more software in it than, um, than you typically run on your, on, your, on your laptop, you know, sending email, uh, for example. Very, you know, low level embedded software solutions but all the way to external software programs that drive those uh, integrated rigs. <coughs> um, now, let's kind of connect the dots between software and amateur radio. Um, in the beginning, you know, Marconi, uh, first hand, I think, um, really no software. Uh, later, as digital modes uh, came out, now who, who remembers the wow signal? Who knows what I'm talking about with the wow signal? Uh, so, you know, a big radio telescope looking for little green men in the sky. Uh, one day they ran across this uh, sort of digitized, and everything was dumped out on paper, and they circled it and wrote the letter, you know, wrote wow on it because they thought maybe that was signs of uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. Nobody knows today for sure what it was, but this was really the start of where radio signals were being fed to computers to get to perform some sort of analysis. And now that we've hit this integrated step, um, now we, we, we've seen a shift from the DSP that was running on the audio only, audio speeds, now they've you know, shifted to IF speeds, and more recently, um, you know, direct conversion receivers. And there's also one other domain that I've been brief, briefly touched on, is, and that's sort of the personalization step and customization of software, which yeah, this particular project, there's a lot of it, um, a lot of it there. So, to categorize software in, in amateur radio, I, I've come up with a total of six domains now. I mean, people can slice and dice these the way that they want, but first domain is housekeeping and convenience. This is the logging and contest program that Steve was talking about. Uh, Web-based uh, programs, which has emerged uh, fairly strongly recently, where Q, you know, QRZ is a really good example of that. The engineering side, where computer-assisted uh, development or design Intended design propagation <coughs> um, software. Uh, as a matter of fact, you, today you can download for free uh, a little CAD package, draw your schematic, lay out the board, push push a button, send an email to a, some company, and five days later you get back pre-drilled uh, PC boards, four layer or six layer, whatever you want. Very cool stuff. Control and automation, uh, station control, Ham Radio Deluxe, one of the um, I think most widely recognized free um, uh, station automation solution, connects to just about every popular popular radio, remote stations, who's, who's operated a remote station before? I mean, very cool, you get, you know, build the master um, station out in, you know, some saltwater island and then you can connect to it and you've got, a, you know, you've got great propagation, great antenna systems, you don't have to worry about QRM or QRN. Um, signal processing, DSP software, Soft, um, software that processes either data or voice, and uh, going back to Steve and um, and uh, Dan's uh, presentation um, about uh, sending data over uh, and along with voice, and then software defined radio where the software is the radio, uh, and then of course what I touched on before individualized custom software. Now what's also very interesting is that of the lower four starting to see a convergence of those. Um, and the rigs that you're buying today, like the L-Craft uh, uh, series, uh, even the uh, Kenwood TS-2000, it really kind of combines these elements into a single box, or uh, a box plus a PC. <coughs> uh, in the control and automation design, it's really software-driven radio. I mean, this is where CAT commands, computer-aided uh, technology, directly controls the software. It's usually RS-232 or US-based or some other serial protocol. Um, and uh, the Ethernet is emerging as a control endpoint. Uh, you can also control other shack equipment. You should be able to get antenna tuners and, uh, and rotors, keyers, general switching you can buy now with uh, USB endpoints. <coughs> and on the digital 
uh, signal processing side, I mean, this is really where you're converting a signal uh, from some other domain, usually RF or IF, to uh, the digital domain, the audio as well. Uh, then you're able to analyze and process the data, uh, and then usually convert it back into the an into some analog uh, domain. And then the upgrade path has been, as I mentioned, from the AF uh, to the IF. Uh, and the way that these, you know, typically work, I'm not going to get too de detailed here, but you have, you know, basically voltage and time, and there are samples that are taken at a periodic uh, rate. Those get turned into numbers. They end up being processed by, like, by lots of fancy uh, mathematics, FFTs, other things. Uh, and then the inverse is applied, where you go from digital uh, to an analog converter, and then often to some amplifier, AF or RF. Now, let's talk a moment about the ideal radio. Uh, you know, back in the early days when they first invented radio, they had this little crystal set. That was one of them. Actually, that's a pretty good design. Um, it turned out not to be very selective, and there's a lot of different um, characteristics that wouldn't be appropriate today. But really, it's very simple. Um, there's an antenna. There's something that converts it from RF into the AF domain, the crystal. And then something to listen to, a little um, earpiece. Well, I think that same analog would be applied to uh, what would the ideal digital radio would be, where you, it's really direct conversion. There is no IF. That means you, you can get rid of those roofing filters. You can get rid of any IF bandwidth concerns. You can get rid of a lot of different things. If, if only you could take RF and directly convert that into, di into uh, the digital domain, process it all you want, and then send it on its way. <coughs> so, you know, in taking that to the next level, let's, let's talk about that in, in terms of ham radio. Um, you have RF input, you have some sort of analog and digital converter that operates RF frequency. Um, you take it to some sort of signal processor, and then when you're done with it, you turn it around and put it right out to an AFM. This would be the receive side. If you want to do the transmit side, it would be the opposite. <coughs> so software-defined radio kind of deserves a definition, I think. One is that radio functionality is defined in software. Um, it's reprogrammable and reconfigurable. Who watches Star Trek? But, you know, it's really funny when, when I've asked people, I've, I've been at a ham convention before when I asked who watched Star Trek and nobody raised their hands. You know? But, you know, when the engineer, when, when they come into some, you know, like major cataclysmic events occurring and, hey, you know, we got to reconfigure the warp matrix to, um, you know, send tachyon pulses out to crush this little globe that's about ready to kill us. Um, and you think about that for a minute. You know, suddenly the engineers trundle off. I mean, they're, they're not sitting there with the, you know, little laser spanners and, you know, plugging new things and everything. Everything pretty much is done conceptually in software. So, you know, you see them just, you know, work with the screen a little bit and suddenly, you know, 30 minutes later it's done. So that's really the idea here is that, that you have some general purpose sort of hardware and you turn that around and you reconfigure it uh, for tachyon pulses, or you re reconfigure it for um, uh, an HF radio, or you reconfigure it to be a transverter, or you reconfigure it to be a um, tracking generator and a, um, a, a spectrum an analyzer. All of these things are possible with the right set of hardware and the ability to reconfigure it. Um, it also uh, supports a broad range of frequencies. Now, now we're moving into more domain specific, meaning ham radio specific. Be nice, you know, I mean, that you can go out today and you can buy the Soft Rock 40, um, the versions of, uh, of SDR, which is really great, but that's 40 meters. Be really great if you could take it from 160 to 10 gigahertz, for example, or 160 to 6 meters. Uh, the physical layer behavior is significantly altered through changes in, so in its software. So, so it's not just putting in a neat little DSP patch, it's actually changing signal paths. It's changing the way it responds to RF. It's changing the bandwidth that the RF amplifier is looking at, or the digital um, uh, to analog converter, or analog to digital converter, 
what part of the spectrum is it looking at. That gives you the ability to you know, do filtering very well. So there are significant, significant changes with the software. Um, and then kind of iterate through some best known examples. Flex Radio Systems been around for a little while with their SDR 1000. They recently introduced the 3000, um, cost effective. Uh, it's competing head on with some of the uh, uh, out of the box radios that you can buy. It does require that you have a PC. Um, so it's not just, you know, you know, pack up and carry. You've got to take your laptop with you, for example. Um, Tony Parks, uh, the Soft Rock series. Wonder Radio, which is kind of a new entrant. The jury's still out on that one. And uh, HP SDR, a high performance software defined radio. And that is what we'll focus on. Now, let's talk. I'm going to dive down a little bit here. We we'll talk a little bit about SDR architecture. And this is modern architecture. So we've, we've already talked about the flexibility of the RF hardware, oh. having the ability to, you know, exchange information into, into at least two domains, going from analog to digital, and then back again. Uh, being able to con to process that information in some in some fashion, um, and then doing. Uh, being able to do something with that processed data. Turn it around, send it out to the transmitter, um, store it, uh, do further processing, turn it into, you know, turn a digital signal into characters that go across the screen, that sort of thing. <laughs> now, most of the functions that we talked about are on this side of the equation. PC, as it turns out to be, is a pretty wonderful device for that. Uh, because it's reprogrammable, repro repro there's lots of software, there's lots of ability for people to go and alter the way that those things, and those are the things that usually matter most to operators as well. So an early SDR receiver, this is uh, very similar to Tony Park's uh, receiver. You have the uh, quadrature sampling detector. Uh, there's some sort of oscillator that gives you a reference. Um, that's a bit for, uh, for hardware. Uh, and then there's uh, baseband um, IQ uh, signals that go into a sound card that sits in your PC. That's what the early software defined radio designed. So the PC was really responsible for a lot more than just, you know, from the, from the other diagram. <coughs> the PC in that particular case was doing an awful lot of this. So it probably ended up here. And, and that's an okay design, but you know the PC, as you know, um, is um, you know requires some sort of uh, you know that connection point becomes very important. This is really a single point of failure. So making this as um, um, reliable and kind of no quantity uh, as possible it becomes very important. So. Now let's take a look at the exciter side. This is, I'm just going to touch on this briefly. Basically the, the, the same thing in reverse. You have a quadrature sampling uh, exciter. Uh, again, a re some sort of reference oscillator or um, so you know where you're at. And then the baseband is, you know, coming out of the sound card and into, um, into the, the sampling exciter. <laughs> now HPSDR, in the specific, it's open source development. It uh, goes under the, the TAPR open hardware license and GPL, right? So these are, you know, giants that kind of got together in a room and it's designed by committee, but, but they got it done. Um, multiple projects, uh, each is a, has a building block for a radio or some other device. Um, it's programmable hardware, uses FPGA and microcontrollers on the board. And it has a unifying black back plane, which they call Atlas. Um, and, th and this whole project is really about advancing the state of the radio arm. This is the next step. This is, um, you know, high performance, direct conversion, uh, direct to digital conversion radio. Uh, the core three projects are Ozzy, uh, or Ozzy Mandis, uh, which is the, the basic interface to the outside world from this, uh, from this group of, uh, of devices. It has the USB port, has a parallel port, has a bunch of other stuff on it. Um, and that's what it looks like. It has uh, six slots. It uses 
a standard ATX power supply that you can get from your PC. It doesn't use all of the voltage lines, but uh, the current board set or board sets don't, so you don't need to necessarily have that, but that's a pretty handy device. You can just take any old PC power supply, ATX PC power supply, plug in and power it up. It has LED indicators to indicate which voltage lines are operational. Uh, Ozymandias um, has USB 2.0. It has uh, uh, Cyclone 2 uh, Altera FPGA. Uh, it has uh, several serial ports, parallel ports, number of general purpose I.O. lines, uh, and something called a USB blaster, which is important because that allows you to update the firmware in the other boards that are attached to the bus. Uh, the block diagram, uh, for those that are interested, I won't go into this in detail. Uh, and I invite you to go to hpsdr.org to, uh, um, to dive into this thing if you're interested. Uh, Mercury, this is probably the most exciting of all the boards they produce. This is the receiver. It's direct sampling. Um, it uses an LT2208 running at 100 megahertz, actually about 144 megahertz. Um, <laughs> it uh, uh, has a, a dynamic range of over 100 dB. Um, which is just incredible. Uh, off carrier rejection at 300 hertz is 110 uh, uh, dBc per hertz. Um, 2000 hertz is 139 dB per hertz. So in other words, you know, when you narrow that thing down on a signal, um, you don't get a lot of uh, interference. You can, uh, you can get a, an extremely narrow, I've, I've used 100 hertz before on a CW signal and it sounds great. Um, Noise figure of 23.4 dB, and then uh, a third um, uh, order intercept point of 46.8 dB. And if you compare that to any of the commercial rigs, you're going to find that those specs are very, very good. <laughs> so, you know, kind of simplifying it uh, in a block diagram. Uh, again, it's, it's direct conversion. There is no IF in this thing. Well, technically, it's a digital IF. Um, but it takes direct RF, anything, anything from 0 to 60 megahertz, and you can go even higher than that with a technique they call aliasing. Um, does have a, its own oscillator, for reference oscillator. It's also capable of being um, um, disciplined by an external officer, uh, um, oscillator. So if you have uh, like a 10 megahertz uh, uh, oscillator that's being disciplined by GPS, and you want to be you know, within you know, 10 parts per trillion of one cycle, you're uh, willing to do that, and it's pretty good. Uh, a digital down converter, which takes it from the HD and takes it down into um, the realm that the PC can um, operate, and then it, it squirts it out to, um, um, uh, US, through USB 2 um, into, the, into the PC. And there it gets processed by um, software. Here's a block diagram. Um, one of the, I think one of the cool things that it does have is that they're really, it does have a preamp, but when you, but the way they've enabled this preamp is instead of, instead of turning on the preamp, the preamp's on all the time, they just insert a 20 dB pack. Um, uh, and, and believe me, on, uh, on the lower bands, um, turning on, you don't need it. You don't need the, uh, uh, the additional 20 dB. It's, it, it's just plenty of signal there. Uh, Penelope, this is the exciter board. Um, does one watt PEP, about half a watt uh, key down. Uh, it's capable from uh, 160 through 6 meters. Uh, it's all mode, and by all mode, I mean all mode. It even has uh, the software is really what defines that. So it has Digital Radio Mondale, for example, as a, a mode if you're into that. It's got um, um, sampling AM, which is really cool. It'll you know zero automatically zero beat on an AM signal, FM. You can choose the bandwidth. I can transmit up to 10 kilohertz wide in single side band, which you know makes a lot of the ESSB folks drool, uh, and also makes a lot of people angry. Uh, <laughs> um, it uses 125 megahertz reference clock or a 10 megahertz um, uh, reference. Uh, it is uh, FPGA. Uh, it is direct uh, up converted. Uh, and one other very cool thing is that they implemented ALC in the FPGA. So that really helps with uh, delays. Uh, you know, AGC is one of those 
parts of a radio like we were talking about before. Where does it fit better? Does it fit better in the PC or does it fit better on the RF side? AGC is one of those that it's important to be on the uh, AG side, or on the RF side, excuse me. Uh, again, uh, simplified Bach diagram. Um, it's essentially the inverse of, of Mercury. Um, the, uh, the full block diagram, a couple of cool features. Uh, they have uh, open collector outputs that are used to drive um, either filtering or, or, or different linears for different bands if you want. Um, it's got transverter outputs. It has, of course, a, uh, a, a, an open drain uh, PTT output. Uh, and it has uh, both uh, mic level and line level inputs. Uh, line level works pretty well if you want to drive that from uh, you know, drive digital signals. You don't have to convert it down to, uh, to mic level. Uh, so, <laughs> after doing my restoration of my SP-104, I started getting really excited about software-defined radio, and I was thinking about a Flex 5000, and I didn't have the coin for that. Um, and I was thinking about, uh, I looked at like the Wonder Radio, and that didn't seem like it was developed far enough. Yellowcraft is a really great radio, but it's not fully software defined. You know, what I wanted was something sort of on the bleeding edge, and, and so that's how I came across HP uh, SDR. Um, the, you know, the three bullets, the things that I wanted is I wanted at least 160 through 10 meters. Six meters would be a nice to have. Uh, 100 watts output, uh, because, you know, you're not going to, um, you know, QRP is cool, uh, and, I, and, I, and I've operated QRP, but for my home station, I wanted uh, 100 watts. I wanted to be able to run it into linear amplifier. I wanted to use it as my main radio. Uh, having it operate on 13.8 uh, uh, volts DC would be really cool. So I didn't like the idea of having like this big ATX power supply bolted to some box. Um, so what I did was, and this is essentially an integration effort. I mean, if I can do this, anybody can do this. I am not an RF um, electronics guru um, at all. You know, I. You know, I know how to compile with a soldering iron, but that's about it. Um, so uh, I'm really kind of standing on the, sh the shoulders of giants here. Uh, uh, I, I, I need the three uh, HP SDR boards, Mercury, Aussie, uh, and Penelope, and then the backplane, Atlas. Um, I needed some sort of uh, a power supply ATX. I needed an RF uh, power amplifier and the ability to filter the output of that so I could stay in compliance. Um, and then I needed some sort of enclosure. So I did some searching. Um, ATX power supply, I found this neat little um, power supply from Pico PSU. It's 120 watts. Uh, it operates from anywhere from uh, 12 to 25 volts. Uh, very cool. And it's very small, too. It just snaps right into the ATX connector. When you come up and take a look at the radio, you'll be able to see that. Um, RF uh, power amp and filter, I spent a lot of time investigating this. Um, I was, you know, I, I wasn't, a, I didn't object to like building a kit, so I looked at some of the stuff by K5OOR. They have a nice, he has a nice little 10 watt, they call it preamp for uh, software defined radio stuff. In fact, I, I bought and built one so I could just test the radio out of 10 watts. Very straightforward project. And he was working on a 100 watt plus a filter solution that wasn't quite done yet, and it was just a little pricey. Um, I looked at uh, some of the communications concepts, um, stuff that's basically the old Motorola um, RF uh, technical notes that they've converted into uh, boards and kits and parts so you can build solid state amplifiers. Um, that's nice, but you know, that was kind of um, uh, clunky, and then I'd have to learn a lot more about um, engineering RF amplifiers than I really had uh, time or the inclination uh, for. Uh, I looked at Tokyo High Power. They had a nice little 100 watt amplifier, but boy, they are really proud of it. Um, and I couldn't get it by the front desk um, for that, so I would, had to resort to my junk box. And in there I found uh, an old TS50S that I had as a mobile a long time ago, and, and you know, it probably still worked, but I didn't know. But as it turns out, the little the power amp filter unit is self-contained and it's easily interfaced, so that's what I chose. Uh, for enclosures, I had basically two choices. Um, of, you know, various gray boxes that you can buy or, um, or use or go to the junk box. And that's where I got the idea <laughs> of, uh, the, of the SB-104. Because 
One of the things I've also kind of experienced over the past few years of operating is you know, with my TS-2000, it's really great and I'm using Ham Radio Deluxe and I'm you know, really used to the interface, it's very handy. But what's not, what's sort of uncool is you know, not having a knob, right? Not having a volume control knob, you gotta reach for the mouse. Um, being able to adjust the filter, you know, because I grew up touching radios, not just interacting with them, right? Um, so, you know, I thought, you know, why not you integrate the controls on the thing, too? You know, so, so I, then I said, okay, well, shoot, I got, I got more stuff to get. <laughs> um, and so I started looking around, okay, well, first I need to figure out how to, you know, get the volume, uh, RF gains, all the buttons, all those things back to the computer so I can do something with it. So I found this little device called LabJack. They make a, a Model U3, and it's basically USB, um, which sort of fit. It has analog in, in and out. It has uh, um, you know temperature pro. It had lots of a lot of little you know gizmos on it, which seemed pretty good. Um, and then for the uh, uh, for the tune control, the VFO control, I needed some sort of circular thing. And uh, there's something called uh, uh, the Griffin PowerMate, um, which is essentially a mouse only if it has a knob on it. Um, and so I, I, I know I got one of those to kind of play with, and that looked like it might work. Uh, and then I needed a frequency display, and I, uh, uh, there's a little company out in the east, Delcom Engineering, that makes these little USB boards um, that, uh, you know, any like four, six, eight uh, LEDs, they're all driven from uh, USB. And then they have you know, some software that you can integrate with to, you know, tell it what to display. And so I said, hmm, with all that stuff, I should be able to make it all work. <laughs> and so the results. Um, after it took me about a month to kind of work through all of the uh, technical kinks. Uh, this is one of the early pictures. Since then, I found out that all USB hubs are not created equal, um, especially when you locate them next to a high-performance receiver. Uh, and so I had to uh, find one with a metal enclosure. Um, I have, uh, you know, you can see here are the three. The three boards, and I'll open this thing up. You can come up and take a look at it. There's the power amp and filtering. There's the um, little spinny thing, uh, and there's the lab jack. And the rest is just uh, you know compiling by soldering, right? Very, uh, very simple. And then I said, boy, you know that worked out pretty well. You know, it, it looks good, works good. Um, I've had I great audio reports, but what about the remote VFO? You know, and so you have this nice little VFOB thing sitting on the Power SDR software. So I thought, okay, well, let's do it again. You know, let's add that to it. So I did that, um, and it turned out pretty well. Now, what's really cool is that I can sit in front of my uh, my vintage station, right? Just snap right in to the rest of my vintage station, and I'm operating, you know, state-of-the-art radio in the kind of vintage mode, and it's just cool. That's all I can say. <laughs> So there are some resources for me. I got, you know, I get set up here as a demo. Um, how much, how are we doing on time? 25 minutes. A lot of time. Kind of scooted to me back. All right, let me, uh, unfortunately this little laptop doesn't have the oomph necessary to start up. Uh, um, but here's Power SDR, that's the software that is open source and there's been, it's been converted for use by this. But you now as you see, you can come up to the VFO knob. You can change the frequency, change the VFO's uh, frequency. Everybody seeing that all right? Um, uh, you know, one of the other cool things about this is that you don't necessarily have to um, make the controls do what they say on the thing. You can make them do other things um, yeah, because it's just wiring it into software, right? So um, I thought, you know, uh, yeah, box gain, yeah, I guess I could. That, that's important for normal operating. But what was really important was being able to change the filter width. There, I'm changing the filter with using uh, the box delay control. Uh, uh, band switching, um, you know, RF gain. Um, you know, if, if, you, if I don't like the displays to, to be in kilohertz, I say, oh, gee, what if I want to move the decimal point? So, you know, let's throw a little software out here. There, changes the display over here to uh, be in megahertz. But uh, I invite you, you know, I'm, you, you might probably have questions, but I invite you to come up, um, ask questions, take a look inside. Uh, why don't we take hand questions first and then 
Um, and then we'll uh, have you come up and take a look inside the radio. Uh, you came first, sir. Yes? Uh, so do you know what uh, off-the-shelf Okay, the question was, which off-the-shelf <coughs> ADC and DAC are being used? Yeah. Um, the DAC, I'm not sure about, um, but the ADC for the for Mercury was the LT2208, or LTC2208. Uh, um, you know, I invite you to go to hpsdr.org, and they've got the schematics there, and they've got the Gerber files if you want to roll your own. Uh, so, uh, but I don't know off, uh, off the top of my head. That's a good question. Yes, sir? Okay, the question was, how much do they cost? Um, so I spent about a kilobuck um, uh, doing this. Uh, I, I bought more than I needed, um, not knowing what I was going to get into. You could you could do it um, for, I don't know, probably you know seven hundred dollars if you had like an old amp laying around, you had all the stuff. But it's you know, I, I got to tell you, I, I've operated. Uh, some pretty decent radios in the past, um, and when I mean this receiver just blows them all away. So it, it's it's an order of magnitude higher grade performance uh, that that I've ever experienced. Um, noise blanker, for example, they've got an interpolative um, noise blanker and a regular type noise blanker. It's you know it, it's better than any I've uh, I've seen. Yes, sir. How does this compare with a bunch of uh, the question was, uh, how does this compare with the Flex Radio? Well, it uses the same core software. So the signal processing software between the Flex Radio and this radio is identical. Um, it's the same library, the open source library that they use. The hardware is different. Uh, depending on which model of Flex Radio that you get, um, one is either USB, so there's a parallel port. Um, version that um, is out there. There's also Firewire. I don't own one, so I can't give you a hands-on sort of um, uh, you know, analysis. I think the Flex Radio stuff, from what everybody I've talked to, they just love it. Uh, there are a few people that had trouble with it, and I'm not sure why, but uh, everybody that I've, uh, I've talked to really likes it. So I think it's comparable. Uh, the difference, I think, is um, one was developed in sort of an open hardware environment, so it had a lot of different uh, input. I think the receiver is a little better, but I don't know. I, I'm not an expert on the flex, so yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I saw you had Visual Studio up earlier when you were preparing your talk. Is the software open source in C Sharp? Is that right? Okay, the question was uh, uh, he saw me uh, doing a little coding right before uh, the demo, uh, and uh, he, the, is the software open source? The answer and is, is it in C Sharp? And is it C Sharp? So the answer is yes and no. Um, it, the software is all open source. Uh, there are, just like o all open source projects, there are flavors of this. There's a flavor for the Flex 5000, the Flex 3000. There's a flavor for HPSTR. There's a flavor for Softrock. There's a flavor for um, uh, the Wonder <coughs> Radio. Um, but it's all open source. There's, uh, you can you know, you have an SVN set up that you go down and download it. You can compile it. You have to use Visual Studio 2003 to compile the, um, uh, the, the Power SDR stuff. They're working on porting it to Visual Studio 2008. Um, I use Visual Stu uh, Studio 2008 and C Sharp to do the glue software. Uh, that kind of glues all the different USB devices together. And, and so, I'm sorry, then what's, the, what, then what's the source code for the project in? The, the, my project? No, the language for OpenSDR. It's a mix between C++ and uh, uh, C Sharp. I was kind of curious about the, uh, the IFD third order intercept uh, point and uh, what your thoughts are as to why it's only minus 43. Yeah. Okay. Plus, plus, um, 46. Plus 46. And I, you know, I, I would not even know the first way to even answer that question. Uh, but if you, uh, Phil Harmon was the guy who designed the thing, and I bet you he'd be able to tell you. You know, maybe how they measure this, I don't know. The oh, I'm sorry, didn't see it. 
boards. Uh, um, it's been a year or two since I learned looked at that project. Uh, at this point, is it reaching kits, or uh, what, what is the level at which you can get all the pieces for the hardware? That's a really good question. Uh, the question was uh, availability. Um, that is anybody that has anything to do with taper, TAPR, has ever known that they do a run, uh, maybe two runs of something, and then basically no longer available. Uh, they consider themselves sort of an incubator, and um, and you know they want someone else to sort of step up and do something with the uh, uh, with device. So um, availability is is uh, semi questionable right now. Um, the, uh, the backplane you can still buy, it's, it's in kit form, so you have to put a little, you know, some SMD devices on it. I did it, and I've got the eyes over 40 syndrome, so I can do it, anybody can. Uh, the transmitter uh, is not available through taper, but there's an engineering firm in Europe that is uh, making a batch. There are people talking on the reflector about starting up some sort of uh, company to, um, you know, to make these commercially available. Uh, the receiver, is still available the last time I checked, though I, I imagine it's it's dwindling. So that's the one downside um, to this, is that someone needs to step up. Someone, you know, we're at Microsoft. If anybody got a few extra bucks, I'll be happy to help them <laughs> dispose of it. Yes, sir? Uh, I, I got one of the kids, and, and I got to say, I mean, there's two parts. One was a pre-assembled one, and the other one was a kit. And then unless you're really good at SMT, you better be careful. So that, that was a, a general comment, a very good one, that um, that when you buy from Taper, if you buy the kits, you better be good at SMT, uh, SMT or SMD assembly because you know, it, it's not for the faint of heart, and I concur. Um, I've built a couple of their projects, um, and uh, unless you have a hot plate, like on the Penelope, um, uh, board, uh, you'd be best to use some sort of a solder mask, solder flux mask, uh, putting that thing together because uh, doing that one by hand would be uh, would be rough. But I am convinced that the performance is good enough that you'll see uh, kits emerge here probably within the next year. Yes, sir, one more. Yeah, the other part of it was when I kind of left it off because there was kind of a Uh, as far as I know, the pro the protocol, the software is completely open source. Bitstreams are all open source. Yeah, yeah. I I I downloaded the software, built the project. You know, the next step for me is to take my little blue app and stuff it in uh, the main app, so I don't have to run two apps. Um, oh no, no. I bought the assembly first. For, for, no. Oh, it would be the Verilog code, the program. No, I, I've just sort of started getting interested in looking at that, but I, I've, I've updated it. I, you know, I have the Altera development system on, I think, this PC here. Um, so, uh, and, and that's used primarily just so I can upgrade the boards. Yes, sir? Yeah, and I see that uh, they are doing the FPGA in Verilog, and that they do have some sort of online uh, classes for Verilog if you want to come up with the speed on that. Uh, Oh, that's a that's a that's a great uh, great point. The the point is that um, that the software definition part, most of that uh, code is done in a language called Verilog, um, and uh, on the reflector, the HPSTR reflector, there's a, a gentleman who stepped up who taught Verilog professionally, and there's a series of I think it's a dozen or more classes that he's given online. They're all recorded. They all have. Uh, you know, PowerPoint slides that go along with them, and it's very good. I've attended a couple of the sessions, and he's quite an expert. And when you get through with that, you, I mean, you're, you're by no means an expert at that, but you can look at Verilog, Verilog Coder and sort of understand what they're doing. Yes, sir? Sorry. Uh, there is, in, in, in that line, for people who are interested in that, there is a uh, uh, software as a service web page you can go to. It's called C to uh, Verilog, and you can copy your Hey, cut and paste your, your, your log for your seat snippet in there.
turn it into bear, into bear log. Oh, there you go. Okay. So if you're interested, maybe somebody who's interested. Yeah, no, send, uh, you send me that. Send me that link. I'd love to, um, I'd love to see how. So they have a, a C to Verilog converter website. So, you know, uh, someone with a small brain pan like me can just write C code and then could spritz it out to Verilog, which would be very cool. Any more questions? Okay, well, I uh, invite you to come up and take a look at the, uh, the rig. I'll pull the cover on it. I ask you not to put it in the transmit boat. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> you really have to come up and see this, the inside of this thing. So, I have a quick couple of things uh, as people start moving around. Um, I need to, well, I'll do that in a minute. But uh, I have a real quick question just to get a feeling for where people heard.